Thank you very much. I think it's uh, great to conclude this part with um, warnings about uh, measurement error and the uh, issue of intercultural um, equivalence. Now, uh, indeed, as uh, Ken mentioned, we are a little bit behind schedule. Nevertheless, um, we can have first reactions uh, right now here, and then uh, we could continue some of the discussion in a smaller group setting. So let me see just first whether there is any reaction from the speakers to each other's presentation. Whether any anybody wants to um, defend his or her position uh, against some of the claims made by fellow presenters. Yes, Michael. Well, I, I don't really want to defend, but I want to thank Andreas for uh, uh, reminding us about the limitations of any of these measurement projects. And I think he's completely right that, um, you know, if, if we aggregate everything to the country year, there are limits on how much, what we can understand about what's really going on. Um, I, I, I teach a course for undergraduates on varieties of democracy, and I tell them, this, you know, the, these numbers are just to start. If you really want to understand, you have to do case studies. And one of the things that you that you learn in a case study is is the proper nouns. You know, our indicators, uh, even the definitions of our indicators, refer to kind of generic actors like parties or the executive or the high court. And in each case, there are specific actors with proper names that uh, do that. And, and we don't really know what our country experts are thinking of when they're assigning these scores to things. Um, and so I think that uh, it's an essential part of really understanding what's going on to, um, to be able to associate the numbers with the specific actors in a case and the specific events that are happening within the course of a year. Thank you. Yes, Hauke. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to ensure that we do have a Turkmenistan report, Ken. Um, we just do not have an expert that is sitting in Turkmenistan. Um, that is the point. We have a Berlin-based and a London-based expert. And for some countries, we just do not have the possibility to have them there because they are identifiable. And they are sometimes under pressure or they get under pressure. Um, we had an Egypt expert that was calling me at night and saying, I cannot no longer work for the BTI because um, they know who I am and uh, I'm, I'm identified and my family is, is threatened. So um, um, uh, that that's all. But you will find a very fine 40 page Turkmenistan report. That is, thank you very much, Andrea Fiedler, um, uh, very much addressing the point of um, what kind of political actors do we have? And what is their spectrum of um, being possible, um, being able to reform? Uh, is there any intention of reforming? This is, of course, not only applying to Turkmenistan, but to all the countries. Uh, I could not agree more that um, um, we should then get to the point, either data-driven or text-driven. I don't really care. I would always advocate to have a text with the numbers, but this is personal personal preference. Um, but we should get from data and text analysis to the point where we are looking at the behavior and the actions of um, uh, of um, those that are politically responsible and what is shaping the actions. And uh, again, I believe this is easier when you're having a text analysis to go with that, but it doesn't have to be like that. Thank you. Well, if I may have a quick reaction. Uh, looking at the um, uh, data presented here today, I was reminded of the fact that we have sometimes a situation of partial democracy, when there is democracy for some, but not for everybody. And I remember that um, VDEM's data for US on one dimension were very low until the civil rights movement had reformed because of lack of equality. And I also noticed that in case of the democracy barometer, countries like Estonia were uh, uh, put very much to the bottom of the quality of democracy. Again, I assume that that was because of the 
way non-citizens, typically Russians, uh, have been treated. But interestingly, in both cases, um, democracy developed pretty fast uh, later on. And today we consider Estonia and um, the other Baltic countries, the most democratic corners of Eastern Europe. And of course, United States also uh, was a front runner for quite some time. So is it possible that um, equality is normatively a very important dimension, but when it comes to the potential of a country to consolidate democracy, maybe it is not the most crucial one. And in a way that takes me to a question, should we consider, let's say, countries like US during slavery, a democracy, or you know, this kind of situation when, when there is a very clear discrimination, but for the rest of the society, there is rule of law and so on um, intact. I was just wondering whether anybody has a quick reaction on this. Uh, Wolfgang, I see you, but was it on this? Or, go ahead, anyway. You are muted. Very briefly on your question, uh, Schold, um, should we call uh, the United States of America under when before they abolished slavery uh, and democracy? It depends very much on the uh, point where you are looking at these democracy point in time. We would not accept today, not only uh, the US uh, with slavery, but even the US before the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1965. We would not consider it as a fully developed democracy because in six single states, uh, black people were not allowed to vote. If we look to Switzerland, we would not, in the year 2000 uh, or 2020, we would not consider Switzerland and uh, and working democracy in 1970 because 50% or 50.2% of the people were not allowed to vote. What I, do I want to say is that the content of the terms uh, uh, is, uh, uh, changing over time, what we consider in 2020 a democracy, uh, uh, a democracy um, uh, will not have been a democracy, let's say, in the United States 150 or only 60 years ago. So uh, if we are um, across times permanently using the same uh, term democracy for the regimes uh, in uh, 1950 and 2020, we do not understand the changing notion of the term democracy, but we are using it. We are using it over time. Uh, uh, and even there are uh, clear differences in our understanding what democracy means today than what it meant, for example, in 1960. Thank you. Um, but I have a different, I have a question if I might uh, into the round. Um, if we compare the 1990s, where we had this euphoria about the end of history and, and uh, development to ever more uh, democratic uh, regimes. Uh, and now for more than a decade, we have not an optimistic point of view or general atmosphere in politics, but more a gloomy one, uh, seeing all the problems talking about crisis and uh, the observation of the indicators, uh, once on Freedom House, but it seems to me on Freedom as well, uh, is the following one uh, that it is our judgment and the experts' judgment is heavily influenced by this general mood, this general political mood. 
the more it is looking uh, gloomy into the future, the more skeptical and negative our judgments will be. And the same was true for the other way around. The more optimistic we judge countries or freedom house like Russia on the way to a liberal democracy in the second half of the 1990s. It was complete, complete nonsense. But at that time, we simply had an optimistic view. And now we have a pessimistic view on the development of democracy. Michael. Hey, just a general observation. Um, I, I think it's important to have consistent standards if we're trying to measure things. Uh, uh, especially over time, it's clear that definitions or understandings of democracy have evolved over the past hundred years or more. But if we want measurements that enable us to make comparisons between past and present, we have to use the same standard for the past and present. It wouldn't, it wouldn't do to have a yardstick or a, a ruler that changes in length to measure different things. We have to, I mean, you could do that, but, um, but the measurements would not be comparable over different periods of time. And I think the same thing applies to different regions of the world. Um, you know, I, I think it's possible to recognize that that words mean different things in different places. But if we want to make comparisons, we have to define what we mean by concepts and measure things according to that standard. And um, um, and, and that's what makes comparisons possible. Thank you, Ken. So, Michael, I, I think that's a really important point, and I agreed with that point until probably about four or five years ago when it came to democracy. And this, and here's the simple reason: I think sometimes there are things that arise that affect democracy um, in, in mostly depressing ways that didn't exist in previous eras, and it's a challenge for us as to how we incorporate those into whether we can build them into concepts um, like, like what is digital misinformation and the subversion of the, the mixture between what we would consider to be truth and fact um, and the manipulation on a mass scale using electronic means, not always through malicious state actors, but through the spread of disinformation and what people, um, you know, what people are being manipulated or just having their minds warped through um, possibly private groups using social media or um, let's say that if uh, you know we all enter the metaverse in 10 years and the, there's the distinction between reality and virtual reality is uh, scary yeah, scary to think of but if that is erased and we have these powerful private actors um, that can have this incredible influence over what we perceive to be reality. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we've we've quite. I'm not sure we can fit that into classic measures yet. Yeah, I think it's a good point, and I I I, I think that doing that. I mean, we we have data through the Digital Society Project now for for that specific point, but. It requires some good theoretical thinking to figure out how to incorporate that information into measures. 